Thank you, sir. All right, just to, uh, as a reminder with the, uh, the singing night next week, that is also going to be combined. So all the teenagers will be with us. So everybody will be together up here, and then we will have the uh, fellowship downstairs. So I think it's, what, 20 or 30 minutes, I believe, of singing, and then uh, we'll go downstairs for just some light refreshments and everything. So I hope everybody makes the most of it. We are in Ephesians chapter 4 uh, tonight. Uh, this is just going to piggyback off of one point that Charlie made this morning with his sermon. Uh, again, we're going through a series that we've entitled We Agree, some things that uh, we're not looking for uniformity. We're not trying to wear the same thing. We're not trying to believe all the same thing. There's room for growth, room for maturity, room for interpretation. But at the same time, there are things that are not open for interpretation. There are things that are not open uh, to whether we agree on them or not. If you are part of, of God's church, then there are some things that must be believed. They're hard, they're difficult, but we must believe them. And I, I say that uh, because next week, even though we won't talk about it at night, uh, we'll get into one faith. Uh, just in terms of research, did you know that there are 4,000 recognized world religions as of this year? Uh, that there's one faith though that says a lot and that's difficult it's not that it's difficult to believe but our current society can make it very difficult in how we want to uh, pluralize we'll get into the point where there's one baptism uh, and that is a difficult subject many of us have crossed that over in a bible study ourselves. but there is one baptism one way uh, into christ one way to be part of christ that is it's one uh, as difficult as it may be uh, we make it a little bit more complicated in our approach. Uh, if there's one faith, if there's one baptism, there's one. Uh, and it should be something that we uh, not just can agree on, but we must agree on. But it's not just that either. One God, one Lord, and then, of course, tonight, one Spirit. So Charlie made a point at the end of his sermon that at some point in our life, being within the, the Spirit being within all of us, that we need to live according to that. Not just to the truth that he is in us, but the, the fact that he is. And numerous passages speak of the fact that the Spirit's in us and that he indwells within us. And that there should be things that are evidence of the fact that the Spirit is in us. So Galatians 5, for instance, with the fruit of the Spirit. That who we are, the characteristics that we have, they are produced by him. And Paul is going to speak of kind of the same thing in Ephesians 4. So if you will, let's read the first three verses of this, uh, of, of this chapter, and then just uh, some, some high points, if you will, some discussion, uh, and then we'll have our class, our class will be done for tonight. This is what he says, I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So if you're taking a, just a few notes, just something you want to write in the margin of your Bible or something that you want to have on your notepad, if that's what you're doing, or just even have for uh, the sake of memory, uh, just some key themes from this, uh, from, from these verses. First of all, when Paul uses the word you in this section, it is plural. He is not talking to individuals, he's talking to everybody. He's talking to the entire church. You plural is something, we don't have that in English, uh, but when he says at the very end of verse 1, to which you have been called, you all have been called to this. If you are part of the body, then you, if you've been baptized into Christ, if you are part of this one God, this one Lord, this is everybody. I'm talking to everybody who can understand that is part of the, the local church then it's, it's everybody included. This isn't, this, what he's about to say and what we're going to discuss tonight isn't for a certain segment of the church. It isn't for the young, it isn't for the old, it isn't for the mature, it isn't for the babe. Uh, it is for everybody that if you are a Christian and you are part of the local church, this is for everybody. No one is excluded from what he's about to say. Then he's going to use this term walk. Eight times. In six chapters, he's going to use this term walk. This means to live it out. And that was Charlie's point this morning at the very end of his sermon. We got to live out 
the truth and the reality that the Spirit is in us. We've got to live out what God has placed within us as that gift, if you will. Acts 2.38, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sin, and you will receive the gift, the Holy Spirit. That is, when one becomes a Christian, how does one become a Christian? He or she repents. They are baptized for the forgiveness of sin, but they are also baptized to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We got to live this out. So when we walk, how we walk, how we live, that's a synonymous uh, together. It's eight times in this letter that that phrase is used. We mostly know it from chapter 5, walk in love, walk in light, those types of things. Well, in this, we're going to walk uh, as far as the unity of the Spirit is concerned. And then he'll use this phrase, call, live out. He'll use this phrase, call, or calling, if you will. So again, listen to what he says in verse 1. I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk, live, if you will, in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So it's not that you've just been called to something, but then you have a present tense. You are actively engaging in that call. Anybody want to take a guess what that calling is? Walk or live in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Anybody want to take a guess? Yes, ma'am. Okay, it could be spreading the good news, the gospel. Okay, to be part of the kingdom. So walk in a manner worthy of that call, of being part of the kingdom, being part of the church. There's one other thing, and it's what we're going to talk about tonight. David. Okay, being a duplicate, imitate him, being a, exemplified after him and living that out. If you're going to have that call, the call of God in this specific context is the unity of the spirit. Live in a manner worthy of the calling. What is the calling? Yes, it is to share the gospel. Yes, it's to be like Christ. But in the local church, it is to have the unity of the spirit. That is the calling that we have. And this is, again, not for some of us, not for most of us, not for the young, not for the old, not for all men or, or all the women and not the men. You all live according to this truth. So this is what he says in verse 3. We're going to look at this. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Does anybody have anything different as far as wording is concerned in that verse? The English Standard gives the word eager to maintain the unity of spirit. Endeavoring, okay? What is that, what is that version? The New King James, okay. Harmony. All right, so we have harmony, we have endeavoring, Adam. Diligent. I'll be diligent. So all of these are capturing an idea of something that's there when it comes to this. So this word maintain, let's look at this briefly. Before we get into the diligence and the endeavoring, this word that's translated as maintain, it means to keep, means to guard, but it also means to have a hand in or, per, or to take a personal interest in. So if you wanted to literally use this definition, then what he would say is be eager to keep or be eager to guard by taking a personal interest in the unity of of the Spirit. If you wanted to take these definitions as what they mean, as literally, and you want what we would call a wooden definition, we're not really concerned about emotion, we're not concerned about how it flows. If you really wanted to just take as literal as you possibly can, be diligent to guard by taking a personal interest in the unity of the Spirit. Now that puts a little bit of a different spin on it when you think about it. That everybody is to take this, keep it, guard it, if you will. So the very first question is a softball question. Why does he tell the church to maintain it, not to create it? Because it's interesting. He doesn't say, go create the unity. He doesn't say, go do this by being this type of person or being this type of member and start it from scratch. He doesn't put the responsibility on us to create it, but the responsibility on us to keep it or to guard it. Yes, ma'am.
Okay, so we have, again, you're right, we're maintaining a peace and maintaining that. Why don't we create it, though? Tom? Okay. Okay. All right. So you're right. Being baptized again and not and and again, God is doing all the work in this. He adds you. He places you according to your where he wants you within the body. But then, like you said, everybody working for the benefit of the whole. OK, go ahead. OK. All right. So, again, the body exists. It, it, it existed before because it's Jesus. He is he is the church. He is that is his body. Bob, were you raising your hand a second ago? Okay, so simply answered, God's already done the work. It's not that he's looking for us to create it from scratch. Uh, Adam, real quick. Okay. All right. So again, the body already exists. It, it, it didn't. It wasn't created the moment a person entered. It's Jesus that it's added. Everybody's added to Christ. So the charge is not to create it because He's already created it. He's already doing it. It's our charge. It's our command to maintain it. But I like to think it from a human standpoint. Uh, go ahead, Miss Mayville. Yes. It is going to be kept preserving it. You know, and we get all the images that are being used with different language. Uh, I think it's just impossible for people to get unified together. We make it extremely difficult. I'll, I'll be honest with even at the very beginning, would a Jew had been in the same body, part of a group with a Gentile? Not without Christ. And that's the point. The point is, and this is why it's the maintaining and not the creating, the Jew would not have voluntarily gone with the Gentile, and the Gentile would not have voluntarily gone with the Jew. Most of them wouldn't. Now, they may have gone to a, a gladiator game together. They may have gone shopping at the same stores together. They may have done all of that together. But would they stay in the same place and say, you know what, let's come to an agreement. We're going to worship the same God, and we're going to follow the same Lord, and we're going to, would they have done that? And the answer is no, because the Ephesian church is guilty of doing that. They were race-based, and, and what Paul is trying to do in chapter 2 of Ephesians is God, through Christ, has torn all of that down and killed the hostility. Don't look at other people based on the color of their skin. Don't look at it based on their economic status. It doesn't matter if they're Jew or Greek. It doesn't matter if they're free or slave. It doesn't matter if they're man and woman. What matters is if you are in Christ. That's the point. And then, Adam, what you said, if you recognize that everybody's in Christ, that you came in the same way in the local church, if we all came in the same way, and we did, again, repent, be baptized, then your charge is to guard what Christ, what God in Christ has created. But here's the thing. It's actually not God. It's the unity of who? The Spirit. The Spirit is the source of the unity. He is the origin. He is where it comes from. It didn't come from Paul in his letter. It didn't come from somebody who thought, I think we're going to go and establish a church here in the city of Ephesus. It comes from the Spirit. The reason everybody here that is part of this congregation is here this morning and this evening that not because we placed membership, but because we were baptized into Christ and the Spirit, the same Spirit that's in Jeff and Glenn and April and myself and everybody else, because we were baptized into Christ, put us all together. And it is the unity of the Spirit, not the unity of the Raleigh Church of Christ. The church does not create unity. The church is here to preserve it. I like what you said, Miss Maybell, to preserve what he's already done uh, on that. Adam.
Yes. Mm -hmm. So we've had the word, yes, we've had the word endeavor. So you mentioned that a second ago. Endeavor, you have diligent and you have eager. What does that tell you? What attitude should each member bring to the table in terms of keeping and taking a personal interest in the unity of the Spirit? Should be a priority. It says a lot, doesn't it? You're eager. You're diligent. What else does it tell you? Okay. That should be, if it's not number one, that should be at the top of the list. Needs to be, there is something that God desires of the local church. And again, I cannot stress this enough. It is not that some of us are eager to do this. It's not that some of us are diligent to do this. Everybody takes a personal interest in the unity of the Spirit in the local church. What happens if there are members who do not take a personal interest in? Yes, <laughs> you would have some stuff that a result of that, yes. was so much so that he led Barnabas away and others so you okay what else what else happens when each member again young or old doesn't matter whether they're brand new in the in the church or they're not whether they're they're young in the faith or they're mature in the faith whether a man a woman even some of us whose children whose teenagers have already been baptized even them all the way down to them why, what happens when there are members who do not take a personal interest in, who do not have a personal hand in maintaining the unity of the Spirit? Go ahead, Jeff. Okay, so they could take a risk. I, and I like, if I could just reverse, they, they take a risk of allowing Satan to come in. And it's not a they versus us and us versus them. Because when one of us does it, the whole body does. The whole body is weaker. So I don't want to just kind of pick on, come across. But Satan does that. And then, yes, falling away, salvation. Go ahead, Carol. Okay. It is, isn't it? And it's fascinating that it, what does the Lord desire for the local church? I want you in or out. I, 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 he doesn't settle for, well, at least you're here. It, it's kind of fascinating to me. Uh, that hurts because I don't know how many times I have said, well, at least somebody's here. In or out. Take a personal interest in. Do you see yourself contributing overall to keeping and guarding what the Spirit has created among us on the cross. Because it took the cross to create it. It did all of that. I, what you end up happening more than anything is Satan can come in into the local church. He can come in in the local body. Yes, ma'am. That's a good point. It's a chink in the armor. Um, I've always heard it, it. Well, I've always heard it. This is a professor who, who said it for me uh, in class, and it's just always stuck with me. And I guess because we we've had animals uh, ever since I was little, um, and we've had dogs. We had any other animal, but just dogs. But you, a dog will find a way out. They, they, and what, they, what they'll do, and I've used this picture before. Any of you have had it. They'll kind of come, come and poke their nose on the chain link fence. Kind of to see if there's some give. I don't maybe, maybe it's just the animal we had, but that's the ones that they, that's what they would do. And inevitably, wherever they did it, that's where the hole would be dug and then they could get in and out. At least that's just what Elisha noticed because Elisha had to fix it. So there was always something, you know, I have a personal hand in that, if you will. Um, but I always envisioned Satan when my professor said, this is what Satan does, is that he's always looking for that peace. 
He's looking for that individual that has that. Or that member or that group of members or whatever. Which is why I think Paul says, all of you. The you is plural. It's everybody needs to be on the same page. And by the way, you don't have to work to be on the same page. You came into the body the same way. You were baptized and given the Spirit. You were baptized. You don't have to work to create anything. The work needs to be maintaining it, keeping it, having a personal interest in who I am as part of the greater whole. So, Tom, who I am as far as the greater whole? Am I benefiting and blessing this congregation? Am I pushing us in work and in step with the Spirit more to unity? Am I allowing myself to be molded? Charlie mentioned a couple of things this morning. Am I allowing myself to be convicted that I haven't had a personal interest in this as much as I probably should? Because I wonder if we did, would we be less likely to complain about the local church? Would we be less likely to gripe about it? Would we be more thankful for it? Would we be quicker to praise it instead of to downplay it? Would, would, what would it look like in our life? I think those are interesting things and concepts. But here's the church. You all have to have this. Um, so we talked about this. Each member obligated to have a personal interest. This is not an option. So the youngest of us to the oldest of us that understands you, the moment you're baptized, there are a lot of things on your plate. The first one, you are an integral part to the unity of the Spirit. Grow into that. Uh, be part of that. So very quickly, looking at a few things. Uh, all of verse 2 and the latter half of verse 3, what are the five qualities each member is to utilize to maintain the unity of the Spirit? He mentions five. Yes. Not the fruit, but they are some of the fruit. They, have, they are conjunction. So you can, I put qualities, but fruit is, is, it could be that. But look at all of verse 2 and look at the end of verse 3. Michelle. And then at the end of verse 3 is the bond of peace. So I included that one. I, it, it may be part of that. Do we call these qualities? can call them fruit. You mentioned fruit. There's a lot of correlation parallel with Galatians 5. So very quickly, with the short amount of time that we have, briefly explain each quality. It's, it's interesting as the Spirit is moving Paul to write this, that these are the five that he mentions to the Ephesians. Now, this isn't exhaustive. You know this from Galatians 5, that there are others. Uh, Adam, you mentioned Romans 12. There's a list there, if you will. But I want you to think for just a moment, just for a moment, meditate on humility. Some of you have a version that probably says meekness. You probably have meekness. Uh, uh, gentleness, patience. Some of you have a version that probably says steadfastness. It captures a better uh, idea. Bearing with one another in love. Long-suffering. Kind of the idea. And then, of course, peace is peace. So I give you that. So, Bob, what do you... So if you didn't hear what Bob said, uh, humility, what, came to, what comes to mind and it's what, what came to mind as well is what Paul teaches in Philippians 2 with the example of Christ. So even then, we're not producing humility. Who's producing humility in us? The Spirit is through the example of Jesus. Go ahead, David. Great point, great point. So you're right, if you didn't hear what David had to say, it's not, it's not the peace and things that we're kind of hearing from a worldly or secular perspective. Um, and this isn't even a peace in terms of a state of tranquility of heart and mind, which is what we normally think. This is um, 
I think, Glenn, you said it. This is harmony. This is everything working together for the common goal. So I like your, your, your image of the car. It's, you turn the ignition and everything, all the cylinders fire at the same time the way they're supposed to. The engine is running like it is, and there's no concern whatsoever that you can go. So the, the Jew would come in uh, and raise his or her hand and say, so this is the shalom of the Old Testament. This is the harmony, the bond of peace. It's not the tranquility that exists, but this is every member working in harmony with the Spirit to continue to maintain the unity of the Spirit in that concept, if you will. What else do you have? Yes, ma'am. Okay, that, and that's a good way to put it, that this, these are not, aggre- we're not going to war for unity. That's not what, we're not fighting for unity. Uh, we're not fighting each other for unity. We're not, you, so I like your terms in terms of passive and aggressive. And Jesus was already, did, he was already aggressive when he went to the cross and uh, destroyed everything. All of that, and in this place comes this. What's fascinating about this, and it did, when Charlie and I were discussing it earlier this week about it, All of these are going to be produced by the Spirit who's in you anyway. The Spirit is going to produce what we need to maintain what He produces. It's kind of, I mean, it's just, it's just one big giant circle. And it never ends because He's the starting. He's the beginning and the end of the whole thing. What we have to do, and I think this is why, to Bob's point, we'll close with this. This is why He begins the whole list with humility. If there is no humbling within the body... If there is no humbling of the person to submit to the truth of what God has revealed, to submit to what is being said within the word, to submit to what God wants to produce, if there is no submission, if there is no humility, the Spirit's not going to work. The truth isn't going to work. Not because it's rendered powerless, but it's not designed to work with pride. God resists the pride. He resists the arrogant, but he gives grace to the humble. How do we do this? The mindset that we need to bring is an opening of ourselves to the truth of what God has revealed in his word. What is that truth? The Spirit's in you. He's in all of you. That's the truth. Are we willing to humble ourselves so that it, what's needed to take the unity of the Spirit and maintain it we're willing to do that. So as we close, I'd leave with, that, with this question from the, one of the definitions. As a member, will we take a personal interest in and have a hand in humbling ourselves so that the unity of the Spirit can be maintained? That's the question. And that's what was left up to Ephesus, and that's what's left up to us. But that's what it means to have this unity of the Spirit within the bond of peace. So 
I hope you had benefited from Charlie's lesson this morning. Uh, I, I know I can tell you this on his behalf. If you got any questions, you can talk to him. Um, or, or myself or anybody else. These are, these are discussions. Uh, we talked about it over lunch, um, but he was absolutely right. We don't talk enough about the Spirit. He's an inanimate object, but he is not inanimate. He lives within you, and I'm thankful he does because he is shaping us more and more like the sun, uh, and that's the goal, to make us more uh, like Jesus. So continue to humble yourself through the truth of God's Word, what it reveals, and what he's doing. Uh, and as Paul said to the Philippians, he is convinced, and I am too, that he who began a good work in you will complete that good work, and he will do so with the spirit that is in us. Uh, if you have not had an opportunity to partake of communion, it's been left in the hallway to my right, your left, room 14. Somebody will meet you there. You can partake of it together. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Father, we pray that we will bring to the table an attitude of humility and an attitude of eagerness to keep and to guard what you have created through the cross of Christ. That is the unity of the Spirit. We're thankful, Father, that the unity that we are to have with one another is not based on the clothes that we wear the, or any type of material good or, or what we do for a living or even, even the color of our skin or the economic status. None of that mattered to you because you show no partiality and we pray that we will show no partiality either. What mattered is, is that all of us confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We repented of our sin and we were baptized into him. To have that sin washed away and when we came and walked in newness of life, you added us to the body, you added us to the family, you put us part of the church, and now you've given us the charge and the command, and not just an obligation, but even more than that, the privilege to partner with you to maintain what the Spirit has created, and that is unity. We're thankful for, for Christ, we're thankful that his sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection gives us hope, gives us peace, and we're thankful for the Spirit who indwells within us who has sealed us and has given us, a, you have given him as a guarantee of the down payment of the inheritance that is to come should we remain faithful with you. Help us to live out all that we, uh, that we have studied here today, this morning and this evening. And Father, we are thankful to you for the life that we have, not just physical, but most importantly spiritual. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.